Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are gathered here for an artist conversation as part of Sky Fine Foods' current exhibition, Moving Slowly Through. We are joined tonight by Amanda Amor Links, Claire Scherzinger, Sabrina Ratte, Olivia Miguel Christ, Anna Eiler, Nicholas Lapointe, and Diana Lynn Vandermeulen. Well, Nicholas is en route. Um, Chris Dorland is also in the exhibition, but was unable to join tonight. Tonight's talk um, is focusing on the motivations and purposes in our work and collaboration, and also about the concepts that connect us all together. We will be able to hear some insight into individual digital processes, techniques, and methods. With their work, each artist here tonight pushes boundaries and expands the field of media arts. My name is Miriam Arbus. I am the organizer of Sky Fine Foods and this exhibition. It's an honor to be here in such good company. Um, after I finish saying a few more words, each artist will be taking the floor and introducing themselves and their work. Tonight's conversation is about digital art, but dwells especially on land, landscapes and our connections to landscapes, both physical and digital. I'm going to take a moment to lead a land acknowledgement. Though we're meeting in a virtual space, each of our physical bodies are connected and rooted into land. We're actually kind of all based in different places, but in this context tonight, I'm acknowledging the local land where I am as the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. For thousands of years, Indigenous peoples inhabited and cared for this land and continue to do so today. We support land back claims, recognize unceded territories, and acknowledge ancestors past, present, and future. I'm also going to read a statement that was generously shared recently by the Indigenous Curatorial Collective. As a settler and descendant of immigrants, I understand that I benefit from Canada's vicious colonial legacy. I acknowledge the resilience of Indigenous peoples in the face of ongoing systematic racism and oppression. I am grateful for the safety, shelter, and opportunity this land provides, stability that makes space for strength and resources to actively resist colonial regimes and imperial supremacy on Turtle Island and beyond. Tonight, we proudly stand in complete and active solidarity with all Indigenous peoples in this fight. Thank you. So moving slowly through is presented by Sky Fine Foods, um, which is a collaborative and experimental project space that presents exhibitions in various virtual, digital, and physical formats. We strive to offer a rejuvenating experience concerned with ecologies, inclusion, simulation, screens, and realities. Our exhibition, Moving Slowly Through, is a collaboration of ideas and visions. We began talking about this together over a year ago, and it's been exciting and meaningful to have the exhibition come into fruition as a hybrid event, existing both online and outside. The online component is co-presented with data.art, and our outdoor screenings are presented with Mississauga's digital public art program. We screened already one time on July 26th and have one more screening date upcoming. For anybody that's local to the Toronto area, I really encourage visiting Mississauga's Celebration Square on Monday, August 16th, between 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. You can find links for both our online exhibition and info about the screening in the description of this YouTube window and also on the Sky Fine Foods Instagram and website. Moving Slowly Through involves an interconnected series of video and moving image works. Each artist presents a landscape that emerges from memories, dreams, ancestral teachings, digital renderings, and personal connections to both land and community. Positioning these varied landscapes alongside each other, one after another, is a reminder of the multiplicity in perspectives and endless differentiations of individual experiences. In the context of climate crisis and our pandemic life of the past year, this exhibition reflects on the significance of where we physically are present and our connections to land and nature. We've been together thinking about the ways that we move, what we do and don't notice, 
the pressures and fast pace of productivity, a yearning for deeper connections and alternative solutions, which inspires us to focus on small details in an attempt to slow things down. This exhibition presents imaginary worlds, portals offered for opening up our minds and rebuilding systems. Through this exploration of self, community, and landscapes, the artists invite those who encounter the works to pause, look, and listen. So tonight we want this conversation to feel inclusive. So anyone out there joining us on YouTube, please feel you can participate at any point throughout by asking a question or voicing an idea by writing into the chat. I will read any questions and comments along the way. And we'll also definitely have time at the end for any lingering questions. And lastly, before I hand the floor over, um, I wanna send out a big acknowledgement and thank you to the EQ Bank who have generously supported tonight's conversation. EQ Bank's dedication to supporting digital and new media arts across Canada is really outstanding. Their interest in fostering a healthy and growing scene is meaningful and effective. And it's an honor to acknowledge their support. So welcome, thank you. It's so nice to be here together. That's a little intro on what we've been thinking about and what the exhibition is about. Um, and tonight, like I said, we're gonna get some more inside scoop on the different works in the exhibition. Um, great. So perhaps we'll just kind of go around in the order of my grid and- Can I jump uh, in really quickly? Nicholas has been trying to join, but he needs your approval. So oh. he's here, but he's sort of flashing in and out like a ghost. So <laughs> um, anyway, there we go. Perfect. Here we go. Hi, Nicholas. Great. You're on mute, but I'm glad that you're here now. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Hello. so sorry. That's okay. Welcome. Thank you. We're just getting uh, some kind of introduction to what's happening tonight and ready to kind of go around and take some time with everyone. Um, so actually, if you're ready, Anna and Nicholas, do you want to start it out? Sure. Okay. That sounds great. Uh, so hi, I'm Anna Eiler, and uh, Nicolas Lapointe is this fellow uh, in the bottom. And uh, our work for the exhibition was called La Fab Duxa 21965. We are media artists based in Montreal, and we have independent and collaborative practices. Uh, this was a project that we put together uh, during a residency in Catalonia. So we were living in Girona for two months, uh, which is about half an hour from Barcelona by train. And we were there to do research into uh, the cave sites that were there. So there, the Serenia National Park is a series of caves um, that have basically been the site of human habitation. Many different groups, in fact, have used the caves. Um, so we, we were really captivated with this with this site uh, and we were graciously supported by La Chambre Blanche and the Ballet Centre which is located in Girona so Chambre Blanche is in Quebec City uh, so it was a collaboration so they basically do an artist exchange and we were lucky enough to be able to um, produce a work through this exchange and initially we had planned this kind of elaborate project of 3D scanning of caves um, but we were also really captivated with the city uh, and the and the people who live there, but also the kind of difficult dynamics that happen because of so much tourism and the kind of waste that that produced, the kind of pressures that that put on the local communities. Uh, so we also wanted to put that into the piece as well. So I will maybe give a little bit of visual context for anyone who hasn't seen the work. I can do a, a screen share and then we can maybe bounce off of each other, Nicholas and I, I'm pointing like he's over there. Um, <laughs> but I'll share this just to give a bit of context and maybe allow Nicholas to talk a little bit about his role and then we can talk a bit about the tech. Um, so as, I mean, I think Anna sort of laid down the structure of it all. Uh, we sort of arrived there and we sort of continued our plan as, as mentioned to like scan caves. And what you can see in the background is actually a composition of all like a, sort of a couple of caves that we've, we've gone in and we've scanned. 
with the approval of the uh, local sort of whoever would work there, they've been super open. Uh, they were very, very interested actually in the artistic part of it. Um, so they were super down. That was never an issue. Uh, we even got a bunch of like extra sort of tours of, of special sort of digs and all that. So that was really, really fun. They also knew the technology that we were using. It wasn't like uh, abstract for them. They, they sort of, they saw us sort of uh, doing photogrammetry. So just taking photos a little bit around and they, you know, they were surprised like, oh yeah, we, we do the sort of the, the same thing, but for obviously so for, for different goals. Um, so we decided to sort of create this like a sort of like a timeline slash caves. This is a little bit where we started with this idea of uh, the cave and why we started there. It's because exactly where we're in Catalonia, there's a huge history of um, humanity sort of living through these caves, different through different periods, different types of humans uh, living in there. So there's these caves around Catalonia have sort of like a long history. Here we go. We're just sort of scanning through a little bit in the images. So we wanted to make sort of like a freeze a little bit, um, sort of telling a story, but without a start or an ending. So even though this would be like some sort of historical timeline, the time is all sort of skewed. Uh, a little bit to sort of reverse this idea of, you know, linearity. Um, but at the same time, so, so it's, it's basically a loop. Uh, the video is a loop. I'm not exactly sure exactly how long the loop is. Like four, six, five, six minutes? Six minutes, 36 seconds. Um, so it's not like, I think some people will notice that it's a loop and, and that's that's fine. It, you know, it's made to be approached at any sort of time to take in, uh, to look into it. And I, and I assume when people see the loop, that's when they sort of, uh, okay, you know, I, I've seen it and go away from it. Um, so there's, there's, it's a layer upon layer of different sort of 3D scans that we've done. So either from historical sites or, or from caves, as you can see on this image right here, I don't, know if, I don't know if you can see it really well on the screen, but you've got a couple columns in the back. Uh, Spain, Girona, Colonia, where we were, has, a has I mean, uh, a big history of different cultures going there from the Greeks, the Iberians, um, the Romans, the Visigoths, and, and so forth. Uh, they are, there's like little nitbits of, of, of every little bit of culture. So we've put this, this all, so we've got some different sort of centuries, medieval Renaissance. And in front, I don't know if you can see, there's a little bit of, of cellulars and, and cans and bottles and things like that. And sort of the, 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 the four, the uh, four plan. Uh, yeah, the foreground, yeah. The foreground. Uh, it's a bit, it's a bit more flu and all that. Maybe you can go on and, and say, well, who's that person flying up in there? <laughs> yeah, so. Um... Do you mind muting it? There we go. Um, so as Nick said, uh, this is done in a 3D environment. So these are all pretty much exclusively 3D scans, with the exception being uh, the flying Dorito, as we warmly referred to it, um, as well as different bottles and cans. So I'll sort of reveal the magic a little bit by showing more the structure of the 3D space. So we actually have, we sort of built built up a fictional environment that layers all of these different elements. Um, so it creates a sense of space when in fact, this was a lot of different sort of pieces that were sort of stitched together. But we found that Girona itself felt like it had been stitched together. And we felt it was also really important to acknowledge our own presence as artists, as tourists, as white folks uh, in this place. Um, so we decided to actually, let's see if this works. Everything's very slow and laggy. This is a massive file. Uh, so definitely technical challenges were, were present. Um, but this body here is actually, uh, I believe this is Nick in a hazmat suit. I also have an incarnation in this environment as well. And we sort of fly through. Uh, so we really wanted to have this kind of like ghostly apparition like feel uh, as we move through the landscape. Cause we sort of felt in some ways like we were almost floating through. Uh, this space. We were very much transient people, um, but we also really wanted to emphasize that that there was this kind of uh, human legacy as well as, um, uh, yeah, like a, a human imprint, I suppose, on the landscape. Um, and we also wanted to have something very, very digital to just also kind of break or, yeah, break, I guess, the environment a bit. So we included these kind of uh, like I said, Dorito like objects, um, they're really 2D. They kind of challenge that, that three dimensionality of the space uh, because we also wanted to acknowledge that it is a fiction, that is a, it is constructed, even if at times it feels almost plausible. Um, 
And we also, I won't do any uh, sound sharing just because it's a little bit challenging, but Nicholas primarily did the soundscape for this environment. So we worked on it together, but he was the, the master at the helm, shall we say. Um, and it has a very kind of like atmospheric, moody vibe. And then the, the Doritos themselves have this kind of electronic, like, a, like an, a feeling of energy or a feeling of um, their own identity because we really are invested in, I guess, sort of not humanizing or anthropomorphizing digital space, but also acknowledging that it has a liveliness in itself um, that is important for us to, to work with. Um, yeah, I probably won't scan too much through One it. One thing I, I, I might add that I, I thought was uh, something that we were really taken aback by. We, we had done a couple of residencies like uh, in, in Canada or, or sort of around, uh, uh, but this going there, it, it was at a special time too in, in, in history with Catalonia. Uh, I think two years after the referendum uh, for the Catalonian so sovereignty. And you really had a feeling that when you went over there that uh, tourists were not welcomed. And as sort of an artist uh, to go there as residence, you cannot not sort of, you know, uh, it has an impact on you about how you see yourself, your own actions with sort of the space of where you are, whether it's ecologically, culturally, um, or I mean, just economically, uh, where we were in the, in Girona, it's, it's an, it's a very old sort of, it's, um, it started as a Roman villa, so it's, it's dates pre-medieval times. And there's layers and layers of history there. And nowadays, all the sort of the people that lived downtown, the old historical part, they used to be relatively poor, has been sort of kicked out. And it's a bunch of uh, Airbnbs or the sort of luxury or auberge, uh, uh, bed and breakfast, th things like that. Um, so we were located in, in a place like this, and we would see sort of the banners uh, against tourism air and the Airbnbs and all that. And it was a, it was a very sort of strange sensation for us because we were definitely tourists, but yeah, we were there for two months and we had the sort of the same, uh, maybe a re repugnancy towards towards tourists uh, ourselves, you know, like towards ourselves, but also like the, the tourists around because they would have an impact on our own sort of movement towards uh, around the city, whether it's going to like get groceries or, or going to the studio or, or whatever. Um, and there's a big impact with like the, the media and all that as well. And then this little town that is, it's sort of very small, right? You can imagine, uh, it's a bit hard to, to imagine here, but it's like a, a small sort of country town with a lot of sort of his, historicity to it. And Game of Thrones went there, I think in 2013 or something like that to film. And since then there's been like an explosion of tourism there. So it was a bit bizarre and for us the, the, to create this sort of this landscape also as not necessarily alien, but as us as being aliens around this, uh, we never felt fully comfortable. And I think it's, it's fair. Like, uh, I think, you know, feeling not fully comfortable was, was a good part of this project uh, as well. Um, but it was something that was very interesting. We didn't necessarily sort of think about that at first, but it has molded a project for sure. So we don't want to dominate too much, um, but we really have uh, appreciated the opportunity to talk about this project. And we really look forward to hearing about the other works, um, which are also phenomenal. Um, and yeah, obviously, we'll be open up to questions uh, after the presentation. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you so much. So, so interesting to get some of that behind the scenes, but like scenery that you were showing. I love to see that. And also just really noted, um, describe the sense of feeling of being alien or uncomfortable in the landscape. And it really comes through in the work in this way where it feels this kind of familiar yet unfamiliar place. Um, yeah. Thank and you. Those caves, like those, those caves are so interesting as well. Um, the columns and like kind of architectural forms. Can you tell a little bit more about the caves and those the architectural forms? So I'll let Nicholas speak to the caves because he is the, hus uh, the history buff of, uh, of this duo. Um, but they are, so they are layerings of 
different kinds of artifacts. The columns we found in um, old baths. Uh, so we were doing scanning and interior spaces. I mean, one of the restrictions of photogrammetry is that you sort of need decent light. Uh, and this became, I mean, we were aware of this, but we sort of thought we would have a bit more flexibility, but we decided to just adapt to the circumstances. So we did end up we did scan the caves and they are in fact in there and they look like caves, uh, but they were quite dark. So a lot of the detail is lost. And I mean, these are sort of like ne almost Neolithic caves. So I'll, there's no there's no real artifacts that we can see. All the artifacts were actually extracted into uh, museums. So we decided to also like layer these objects that had been taken out of the space um, and kind of layer them back in, but then layer them with a whole bunch of other things that we found in this very kind of palimpsestic sort of uh, process. I mean, we sort like. I think something that's also interesting, and also to, to sort of criticize our own work as well. Like, there's a weird. We went in there and we butchered the stuff there. Like, the the architecture, we just cut it up. You know, like we we recorded it and then we just cut it up. Same for the caves. This is like the house. You know, the, the habitation. It's like, it's like culturally loaded, and often because of what Anna says. We would go in and we would try to take as many sort of photos and document it and come out. We would have, have this nice, this nice bits of it, but then this other bit would be, you know, so, so. Uh, so we take the best parts and then we created our own sort of like monster of a cave. So it's like we wanted to also like be aware of this. Uh, and honestly, I wouldn't say it's like a lack of respect because we're so genuinely interested in it, but we did sort of just like destroy it in there. There is a certain part of it, a big like, you know, colonizers taking taking objects from somewhere and putting it into a museum and saying like, this is it. It's we've done, we did that a little bit with this project, but I think like putting ourselves as like aliens and all that may hopefully, you know, toned it down and all that, but it's, it was something that um, unfortunately you don't see a lot of like the original forms and all that. For, for us, it was important to have the, like the material artifact of it, like uh, even going to like a uh, 3D scanning, like dolmens, uh, which are based rocks, you know, planted to, to, you know, create like some sort of uh, geometric formation for a uh, sarcophagus or something like this. Uh, we sort of would take that and then, you know, build something else with it, put trash on it. But that being said, that was also very much our experience of Girona uh, because there were so many layers. Um, so sometimes you would see like something that was 2000 years old and it was, you know, you have like, I don't know, uh, an H&M in front of it or some sort. Like there was all this layering that was happening in real time in, in the space and all the spaces we were occupying, which was really surreal, um, I think, for us. So there was also this idea of kind of echoing back our experience, um, which also, I mean, I haven't traveled as much as I would have liked to, but coming from Canada, I'm. Uh, this was also like just seeing in a city, this kind of layering of history of potentially thousands, tens of thousands of years was really kind of uh, amazing to see in this kind of way, in very tangible way uh, in your daily life. It was really kind of magical. So I think we also wanted to record that, but as well as acknowledging that, yeah, it's, it's not meant to be a reality. It's meant to be a fiction and everything is sort of constructed as well. So. Mm. I, I think that really resonates and that idea of layering, you know, it's, it's kind of what we do, you know, we take from what was and add on or build up and sometimes preserve a facade or um, try to integrate. But yeah, that really resonates. Um, I thought speaking of kind of alien environments that Claire, you might want to go next. Uh, sure. Yeah, just to make sure I hit the unmute or yeah, I'm not muted anymore. Great. Okay, you know, it's like being a digital media artist, you think we'd have a better, I'd have a better understanding of like how to be on Zoom, but sometimes it's a little, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, yeah, um, well, I, yes, definitely I can speak to sort of alien landscapes. Um, my work uh, deals with uh, science fiction. Um, it deals with the imagery from that genre that you might come see in like, you know, fiction um, that you might just see on TV. Um, but mostly I'm inventing worlds 
uh, that are inspired by, you know, all the, the plethora of images that are around us. And I build my own worlds to escape reality. Um, but it's also trying to, it's the kind of puzzle, the intrigue of the puzzle of trying to build a multi-layer functioning system that is endlessly intriguing to me. So, and if I'm looking down a lot, I like, I have notes. So that's, I'm, I'm looking down, I'm reading, I'm trying to be succinct. But uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I like critiquing tropes, uh, typical tropes in science fiction. Um, I also write science fiction, like I'm in the process of trying to build up my professional CV in that arena. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna go to screen sharing as well because I have images and they will do way better than uh, all the, the stuff I'm trying to say right now. <laughs> so, uh, can you all see my presentation? Yeah, we see it. Great. Good. Yeah. All right. Full screen that. Okay, um, here we are. Also, as a sidebar, uh, we were talking about links earlier, and I just kind of like it was an aside, but these are two links of uh, climate related uh, charities that have really been important to me. Uh, so like the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust, you can sponsor or adopt an, a, just an elephant or a rhino. And it's actually really satisfying getting all the updates. Uh, it makes my day sometimes. And then, uh, and they're like, of course, because of climate change, these animals are, uh, you know, they're, they are being impacted and this particular uh, charity is dedicated as much as they are to care of uh, elephants and rhinos about re like building habitats for them to making sure that they get access to water, anti-poaching in initiatives. So I've, I really like that one. And then Amazon Watch is a really important one to me because the work that I'm about to show you was actually originally inspired by a trip to the Amazon way back in like, um, like early mid 2016. And uh, I was there in the jungle and I left that uh, just, it was just a trip, it wasn't a residency, but I left that place, uh, you know, inspired by the scenery, but also very cognizant of the fact that it's not my home. And I was like, I want to be in a place like this, but I think I need to just invent my own worlds in order to recreate the feeling that I'm having right now in this amazing place. So that like that was years ago, but it carried through. And uh, I eventually went to grad school and I started I, making paint, like I was making paintings. And I guess an important kind of background note about me is that like I have been, I was painting since I have been painting since forever. I still identify as a painter as much as a digital media artist, but uh, I don't really paint right now because it just, I haven't found what I want to do next with the medium. So, you know, it's kind of like, it's there. I have a painting room, but I am working digitally, uh, like exclusively right now. But I thought I'd share some of these images just because they are a really important uh, jumping off point. And uh, the, when I did my MFA at the University of Victoria, I was working with Kelly Richardson. And uh, she, of course, like the digital artist is like to her students, it's like, you should try working digitally. And I was like, okay. And I was like, I like this. And she's like, yeah, you do. Uh, but this is some of the work I also made when I was working with her. So I thought I'd share them as uh, just kind of like a jumping off point to my digital work. So this is all oil and uh, spray paint um, and some acrylic on canvas. And they're quite large, at least these two are. Uh, these are just some of the highlights from my uh, MFA grad show. Um, and I set about creating, like just inventing an entire world and dealing with landscape as an entry point uh, to that. And I was, uh, I, I didn't want to deal with any kind of like, um, not like deal with building like civilizations and what buildings would look like or what architecture would be like, but I really just wanted to get down. What does the landscape look like? What are some of the creatures that might inhabit this space? And it was just like a lesson in um, 
uh, world building, of course, but also just uh, how we view alien life beyond like what is the current culture surrounding um, the search for extraterrestrial life. And that was very just enlightening as to examining the culture and what other people thought aliens might look like, what they actually, if people actually believe that they exist, what are people's conceptions of what other worlds might be like. Um, and so I set about to create intriguing images, but also to um, kind of just uh, question that, uh, just question where we are with that, because we are, the point of this being is that we are in an active space, like we are in an active area or time of space colonization. We have billionaires jetting off uh, to space and we are preparing to colonize the moon. People want to colonize Mars. And I, my big overriding question for making all the work that I make is what are we going to be like? How, what are we going to act like uh, in these different spaces? Are we gonna be how we are now as uh, like colonizers or in a tra trying to be at least a uh, transition to a post-colonial kind of attitude? Are we going to continue extracting resources? What is that going to look like? So my work is kind of just a continuous inquiry into those questions um, through landscape, uh, because I do really care about um, just the landscape as entry point into talking about environment and how it influences like uh, culture and uh, you know just who we are as people. So those are just like, uh, some other paintings that I have. And uh, I'll transition to showing some more digital work. I don't have, uh, I have a video of the, um, the work for this exhibition. Um, and the work in progress is on my PC. I'm on my Mac right now. So um, I might, I probably won't show work in progress or how it was made. But uh, I mean, honestly, it's really similar in some many regards to and then Nick's uh, screen that you saw a little while ago. Um, so this was uh, one of the works uh, that was part of the EQ Emerging Digital Artist Award. Um, and uh, basically, uh, I have just been like on an upward curve of learning various softwares. Uh, <laughs> and it's really hard. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, this is a this was a work that was about uh, if viewing another world through the fictional uh, device called an ansible and uh, that's that device is kind of like made me think about how uh, we would view other worlds because an ansible is a fictional device that basically posits you can see other worlds in real time there's no like delay as there is that like you know you have like a uh, a day like 24 hour delay like between here sending a message between here and mars or whatever the delay would be so the ansible allows you to uh see the other world in real time and uh i went with that premise as uh how we would be viewing this world that you see on screen and so basically it's like a console and as it appears here so that was my first kind of like um really taking science fiction themes and tropes and trying to bring them into uh, a, 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 like a digital artwork. Um, and the, that video is 20 minutes long. So I'm just, uh, I'm just gonna go through some more stills. Uh, so I continued working and I started making more uh, work. Uh, some of it, I just uh, needed like complete help in making the images uh, and I luckily had uh, good friends who are willing to teach me and help me and uh, some of it it's just like it's again it's that uphill battle and like teaching yourself software um but yeah uh i made this i i started uh looking at um novels that are in the public domain and i uh and that's an influence for uh, my later works now. Um, I started taking works that are like audiobooks that are in the public domain and kind of recontextualizing them as uh, science fiction works. So in this piece, The Garden Along the Coast, I took uh, The Secret Garden and I redid the voice. Uh, I uh, 
made this kind of world here and uh, it takes you through this kind of garden, uh, but with this recontextualized uh, novel that uh, is going along with the images. And I was just interested how like some of the themes that are like, you know, just in literature and in science fiction, there's a lot of the same stuff. But in this piece in particular, I was just curious about um, examining how we uh, look at other worlds as either perhaps exotic, well, as exotic, and as sort of like this kind of like hinterland where we, uh, where the rugged individual plays out their, their, their problems and the problem, how problematic that sort of that trope is. Um, so I don't wanna go on too long. So I'm actually gonna skip over this uh, next slide um, and go straight to the work for this exhibition. Um, so uh, this work is called Campfire and uh, I'm gonna refer to my notes again. Um, this is 40 minutes long, but there is a shorter version um, that's much, much shorter. But I was thinking about this work much in this, like with the mindset of a painter. And I was like, I, like we've all been in galleries. I don't know, but I get this kind of like, this feeling where my legs start to go numb. Like my body is kind of like in the process of being absorbed, of looking at a painting and for other works, sure. But I find it occurs more with painting and like screen-based works where this just like this, uh, this blending and this, uh, that happens uh, just like this bodily experience starts to take over where I feel weak or I might need to sit down, but I ask all these questions. It's like, how is that painting made? Like what, what is going on in that corner there? And really just examining it. And I wanted that to be a thing that happens in this video. Um, so if it were to like, and it's going to be presented again at uh, YYZ Artist Outlet in September. So at a larger scale, so I really want that to be a thing that uh, can occur like with a painting, but with this piece. And so there are different, many different worlds that appear in this work. And I'm just gonna take a moment to uh, play it, not like play it, but at least like scoot us along to a different point in if I can. And if, I don't know if I can on keynote. God damn it. Sorry, it's uh, there's no like uh, bar that you can. Uh, I'm gonna have to go to the actual file. So, uh, apologies for this. I didn't think it through when I was like, I'm gonna play this piece, and uh, yeah. Oh, it's down here. I think there. I think yeah. Um, Two, 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 two. web version i'll play that since it's uh yeah so i just want to scoot along here too so you can see like some of the uh, like the world's like all the scenes that i built <laughs> um and i can kind of drag it along without taking too much more time so um yeah it's long um there are different worlds that are happening here so we have like ocean world and metal world. And uh, it was really a good exercise in like playing with uh, just all these different features and whatnot and building different scenes and filming them inside Unreal Engine, uh, which is the program I've been using. Um, yeah. And I also, uh, so uh, Megascans is a great, uh, a company, I guess, or Quixel is the company, but they do something called Mega Scans, and they have tons of free content. Um, so I hopped on that and was like, I'm going to take some of this free content. Um, so you can kind of see there's like winter world, um, just to be kind of like, you know, quick about it, although that doesn't necessarily like, uh, dis like describe it or it's in its entirety. But there are these different scenes. And I wanted to give the viewer kind of like an insight into all of these different places. Um, but to get to the main point of what the work is about, besides just being kind of like a love letter to digital art and painting, is uh, the term campfire is a response to uh, the dark force theory, which has uh, been popularized in a recent science fiction novel by Chinese uh, writer Chi Chen Lu. 
Um, his book is called The Dark Forest, and it's part of the trilogy called The Three Body Problem, um, which is actually being made into a series for Amazon now. Um, but uh, the dark forest theory, to give a very quick recap, is basically uh, the universe is a dark forest. Various civilizations are strong, they're hunters, and they're trying to hunt weaker civilizations and destroy them because if they don't, then there's the potential that these weaker civilizations beca could become stronger and then one day destroy them. Um, so as such, people are, everybody is hiding. They don't want to know the other's location, um, which Earth is not doing because we send out probes and we send out signals on radio like all the time, but whatever. Uh, that being said, though, I wanted it, I, I, I want to respond to it because it's just, uh, it's such a survivalist way of thinking and it's just something that I don't necessarily agree with. It's just if we're not positive or like if we take this kind of like mode of thinking, um, it just, uh, it doesn't encourage kind of like, I think anything that doesn't encourage communication is probably detrimental. And I think uh, that as much as co space colonization will have terrible effects for the solar system, I think that like it should be, we should still be exploring and, uh, you know, reaching out. So campfire is very much like we should be gathering around the fire and like, you know, finding each other, of course, based on the axiom that you think other worlds and like other uh, civilizations, if they can be called that exist. Um, I think that's really just the way forward in terms of like the thinking uh, that we need as we approach spacefaring because it's happening no matter what. Um, so that's what this work is in response to. And the landscape I feel is like really just the biggest and the best entry point and the most intriguing entry point into dealing with this subject matter because I think that's something that uh, going for, like that is something we share as people, as humans is just like, we care about our home. We care about, I would love to think our world at least many of us do, but not everybody. Um, so that's more or less why I went about this piece. And I think I've gone on too long, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> so thank you very, very much for indulging me um, as I talk about science fiction. I really appreciate it. And hold on, I have to stop screen sharing. <laughs> uh, stop share. There we go. Thanks so much, Claire. So wonderful to hear about your work. Really, um, really thinking about, you know, how your work shows that the landscape, whether it's imagined in all of these different forms is so full, it's so vibrant. And I love that you give this attention to like the potential of, or not the potential, but like the acknowledgement of many life forms. I feel like it's such a dangerous mentality that humanity has some some people in humanity have had that assuming there's empty space that's like claimable and that is what we're kind of seeing in these conversations about moons and mars and wherever that there's like that it, because it's empty it's it's available and i think that's really problematic so i like that you're you focus on this really vibrant diverse potential of different landscapes Okay, so, um, so great to hear. So nice to hear this in depth. Um, I'm wondering if um, Olivia, would you like to go next to travel to your work? So hi everyone, and uh, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Claire and Philip. It was really interesting hearing about the process. Um, I'm just hoping that everyone can hear me okay because I have a pretty large fan behind me because we have a very Impressive amount of heat in Montreal, Dodrago, where I'm based. So just let me know. Um, cool. So I think, uh, Claire, what you said towards the end is like a great way for me to link to what I'm doing, uh, which is amazing. Oh, both really amazing. Um, I just wanted to situate uh, my practice a little before, though. Um, so my name's Olivia, and so it took me from also reading from my notes on the same screen. Um, I'm a multimedia artist, but I'm also a doctoral researcher and an educator, and I'm from both Europe and the Caribbean, and I'm currently living in Quebec, Montreal. 
Um, so I guess what I wanted to share, and I haven't done uh, this work of compiling everything, so bear with me when I share screen, it's going to jump between a multitude of programs and display files, so uh, please uh, bear with that. Um, I guess I'll share screen right away, um, but just after I explain uh, where I'm coming from, in terms of my current work, um, it's, it, I think it's helpful to see uh, what uh, brought me here. So I began working with VR, virtual reality, immersive technology, and digital environments or landscapes, you could say, uh, from about 2014-2015. Uh, but prior to that, um, I'm, you know, this work was drawing from my experience of being uh, a white woman of Jamaican heritage and of French heritage. Um, and I was working with performance and photographic self-portraiture uh, between 2011 and 2014 when I returned to live and work in Jamaica. Uh, I created an alter ego called YT, um, and I featured YT in a variety of very static poses, uh, wearing a white mask um, in specific Caribbean locations and landscapes. So I'll just uh, do a screen share and hopefully this will uh, make sense. So I'm going to share a full screen. Um, I'm on two screens, so hopefully you only see the one I want to see. Yes. Um, so, uh, I have a PowerPoint which I'll just go full screen with for a second. Um, I started questioning uh, the privilege I had uh, both as a white person and in other ways as a woman, uh, as a white woman in the Caribbean. And so these were the types of images I was making. And this one in particular, um, I co-created. Co it's um, my alter ego standing on this fisherman's boat in a place called Discovery Bay, uh, which is one of the locations where Christopher Columbus arrived, or you know, so-called discovered um, Jamaica. Uh, and so uh, yeah, that helps to situate the work I was doing prior. I'll just kind of whiz through a few more images so you get a, a sense of the aesthetic. Uh, a variety of different images in various places in the Caribbean, which I won't go too, further, uh, too much further into this, to situate the, the visual approach I had before. Um, I bleached my hair and I wore different clothes for various reasons. Um, and so, yeah, you can kind of see. Um, great. So, I'm going to stop the slideshow there. Um, and then I'm going to switch over to um, some of the images from one of the two pieces I'm showing uh, in this exhibition. One of them is From Many Sides, which is a video created as an artist commission for. Um, what was uh, the Davidoff Art Foundation or Art Initiative, which is no longer um, in existence, but has been um, a lot of the, well, one of the main people behind it and many of the people related to it are still active in what is now the Caribbean Art Initiative. Um, what I'm going to do is just show you, as I come from photography uh, in terms of technique, um, I created a video that was, uh, you know, commissioned to be a 10 minute video. But the idea behind this um, was to create 7,000 unique prints that could be printed on boxes, which were the cover of cigar boxes, Davidoff being um, you know, a company that produces cigars in the Dominican Republic. Um, so of course, there was a question as to how I should engage with that. Um, but I'm just showing you how I went about making such a project. Um, I'm not going to show you all 7,000 images, but just a selection of them. Um, and so I'll just go full screen on that for a second, so you get an idea. Um, and so, in other words, throughout this 10 minute video, um, the idea being conceptually to show, um, you know, it began with the following idea. How could I portray an experimental video sequence of a contemporary river mother or river mama or mermaid? Uh, this character that is staged in this particular image, um, the rest being people who would just actually happen to be in this particular location. Um, and then this idea I had initially, which I was already working on in this video, I brought in relation um, with uh, the idea of, um, well, this ongoing exploration of the relation between cultural hybridity and the representation of water through um, a Barbadian poet and, and historian called Kamal Brathwaite and his notion of tidalectics or tidal poetics, uh, which sees water as a site of memory. So in many ways, a lot of the work I'm doing now is still exploring that notion of water through the perspective or through the lens of Caribbean futures. Um, I'm going to expand more on that in a minute, but I'll just give you an idea of you know, how uh, one uh, single screen video can incorporate uh, such a variety of different images and, and approaches which are all related through um, my fascination with water in those particular locations. 
So again, I'm just kind of whizzing through um, the, you know, the best of uh, from this piece, um, just to give you an idea. Um, there we go. And by the way, uh, the director of photography for this piece is Ivan Herrera, who's a Dominican filmmaker and documentary photographer. Um, so then to give some context as well, if anyone wants to know more, I have a few links I can share later, so maybe that's, this is not the time. Um, and I suppose I could do all the screen sharing in one go. Um, what I wanted to share with you as well is because I'm showing two pieces, the other piece I'm showing is called Myra. Uh, Myra combines digital underwater worlds with performance art, uh, where viewers are still uh, amidst a virtual, what I'm calling a tidal wave, of course it's digital, um, and it's represented through 360 video stills and some 3D within uh, created or put together with Unity 3D, the game engine. And um, it's all animated. There's no interaction in this virtual reality experience. Um, and in this case, the virtual wave, um, to me, evokes uh, the Caribbean's complex relationship with water from uh, geographical dependency and you know, needing to cross the water to get out of the Caribbean space. Uh, to the ongoing and increasing threat um, of, uh, you know, environmental, I would say, precarity or precariousness uh, that some of you may follow just simply through seeing the increasing amount of tropical storms and hurricanes that um, are affecting people living in the region. Uh, it seems like more and more every year. Um, one thing I wanted to touch upon is, for example, just to kind of cut through to creating work in virtual reality, which is often uh, not very accessible to many audiences. Um, one of the things I've experimented with is creating screen versions where I'm still exploring this notion of being in a fully immersive space, in other words, a 360 environment that you can look at and, for lack of a better word, feel like you're in by wearing the headset, the goggles. Um, but of course, if, you're not a, if that's not available to you, I still feel compelled to create versions um, that are um, designed for the screen. So I was just going to show a short, uh, maybe a few seconds from this, I'm gonna turn the sound right down um, and just play that um, right now. So yeah, this is uh, the 360 video screen ready version of the piece that I'm currently exhibiting on um, in the exhibition. Um, perhaps if it's useful um, for anyone here or you know, in the audience, I have been working with digital tools in 3D environments. I'm less savvy than, than many in modeling or creating 3D environments myself. However, I've okay, I'm turned the sound right down. Obviously, I can't keep over it. Um, what I have found, however, is that um, through exploring the different ways in which I can activate still images, such as here, uh, by using shaders in, in game engines, uh, this is kind of a happy accident that allowed me to go further in bringing multiple processes together in a virtual space. So I'm going to stop there and um, kind of switch over to what I'm doing now. Sorry, this is my. Um, so what I'm working on now is a larger project uh, that Myra, the piece you just saw, is part of called Virtual Islands. Um, I'm going to make this full screen, of course, because I realize that you're watching my screen. Um, I'll just play this uh, maybe half a minute of video um, and perhaps then stop sharing screen and talk a little more about my process. So I will do that. Talking. This is a kind of compilation of the various iterations that will be visible um, soon uh, in the final or one of the final iterations of virtual islands. So I'm just going to play this now.
it's good enough right here. Um, and then um, I don't have uh, the links. Sorry, I'll speak to the links at the end and I'll share them in the chat. However, I wanted to highlight uh, on uh, Miriam's request, which I thought was great, um, two, uh, well, one project called the Naniki project. This is, excuse me, I'm jumping between things. Um, you, uh, Miriam, you asked us to highlight uh, various projects or various uh, people that you feel are working, um, you know, with art, technology, and engaging uh, the current climate crisis. Um, and so I wanted to highlight the work of uh, the um, author, uh, Unia Kampadu. Uh, I'm going to kind of, well, quoting from this page, um, I'm going to read out loud uh, what the Naniki project is. Um, it's an eco-social multimedia project in development uh, based on uh, regional mythology, fantasy, heritage, science, and arts. Uh, Unia is a citizen of Guyana, Grenada, and England, and works in the Caribbean region as a consultant and social development researcher and writer. She is also currently based in Georgia, Montreal, um, and she can be considered as a creative practitioner, activist, and she specializes in interdisciplinary and intersectoral communications. I'm reading the article from this website, which I'm happy to share. Um, Naniki is ongoing. Um, I will hopefully be involved in some, uh, in some capacity soon, so more news coming on that. Um, I wanted to just highlight as well uh, how um, Punya has been working on other projects such as Harry Sealand. Um, this is just a kind of, you know, you have an idea of uh, the other folks involved. And Carrie Sealand's page um, is excellent. It's uh, a digital research and community inclusive project of Create Caribbean Research Institute, the first digital humanities center in the Caribbean. Um, so since 2015, the Create Caribbean has worked to answer a question about the future of the Caribbean as a livable place in the age of climate change. Um, I'm going to stop there and I will then stop sharing the screen. So hopefully that was helpful uh, for anyone who is curious about that. And I wanted to also mention, I checked in with Unia Kempadu and if anyone wants to know more, uh, she can be reached uh, through LinkedIn at the moment. Um, so again, I can share that later. So I'm not sure how much I'm uh, going in or over time. Uh, please let me know. I have a few more things I wanted to share, but I'm happy to resume or you know stop if that's uh, over. Um, Great, I think, yeah, sure, Olivia, continue. And okay. I'll just ask you to share that link if you don't yeah. mind in the chat. Yeah. And then I'll yeah. be sharing those on our YouTube and sure. also in our website documentation later so that we can include those links. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I'll do that once I finish speaking so that I'm not kind of, yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah. Crossing everything over. Um, I guess I wanted to speak more a little on, um, you know, what is this motivation for engaging with uh, academic research and then also making work that I'm exhibiting. I'm fortunate to be exhibiting it regularly in, on various platforms. Um, so the ongoing project is entitled Virtual Islands and it combines a VR, virtual reality experience, and a multimedia installation. That's something I haven't spoken about much, but I'm also uh, really excited about how VR can be contextualized within a physical environment, which of course since COVID-19, since the pandemic has been a real massive, huge question mark for anyone working with that media. Um, what I was initially motivated to explore was the question, um, what might a Caribbean future look like by Dr. Marsha Pierce, um, who's based uh, out of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, and so the project overall investigates ER, virtual reality, as a decolonial tool through the notion of Caribbean futures. And one of the main things I've come back to again and again, and I'm now much more um, well, clarity has come through more and more reading and, and rethinking what I did in the past and what I'm doing now. But essentially, uh, my own experience of uh, cultural heredity, being a white woman of mixed European, European and Caribbean heritage, um, is brought in relation uh, through a virtual encounter with water and self portraiture. So I'm positioning my own body in this work increasingly for various reasons, one of them to just situate what it is to benefit from the privilege I have and also question it at the same time, uh, whilst also um, you know, getting more and more um, familiar with the different ways you can look at patriarchy, you can look at um, feminism, intersectionality, and try and figure how your own voice can, uh, can add to the conversation or not, um, and to be more aware of, of where, you know, where I can do something useful or not. So um, yeah, that's, that's for the, the ongoing project. 
Um, one of the main notions I am questioning is the notion of PR and empathy. So I'm going to stop there for the research, but I'm happy to speak on it after. Um, and in, in just bouncing off, uh, you know, again, what um, Mary and you were asking us to think about, um, there are actually a couple of other projects I'm working on with other people, which are not quite ready to, to you know, I can't really talk to them right now. Um, but one of the main concerns, which you can see through my own work and, and now in these other group projects, um, is the, you know, particularly my, my concern is the global impact of rising water levels and rising water temperatures which of course affect places like the Caribbean firsthand, um, and of course due to climate change, uh, through that lens, through the Caribbean futures lens. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, you know, continue my, um, you know, journey in collaborating with scientists, environmentalists, or any institutions that want to support this type of project and also highlight solutions, not just, you know, focus on the negative aspect, but really highlight sol solutions. Um, and yeah, I think, um, I mean, that's pretty much everything I wanted to say. Um, I am happy to speak more to the very loaded concepts and very loaded issues I've just, you know, whizzed through in a few minutes. Um, and yeah, I mean, if anyone has a question, feel free to email me directly as well. I'm on a bunch of different media platforms and really excited to hear more about any all of these other topics. So I'll share the next now. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Olivia. Did anyone, if anyone else wants to jump in, please feel free, okay? And uh, I'm just, um, it's so amazing to hear you speak and hear the insight and some of the background. And of course, to watch the works in full, you can find them via Sky Fine Foods website. Think that there's a really important emphasis on personal connections and kind of in how inextricable we can we are from land environment. Like we can't think of one without the other, and I think your work really demonstrates that and gives a focus to that. It's so important. So thank you. Um, great. So I thought Amanda. Perhaps you would like to speak about your work next. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, it's like really amazing to see how well thought and gorgeous everybody's work is that I just kind of have my mouth like open looking at the beautiful works you made. So thank you for having me be part of the space. Um, my name's Amanda. Um, uh, Gwen in Deloise, a Buxigan, the Namagi Deloei, Wagna Cook Deloei, Agwe Guelph, Agwe Jojabe. So I just said in make my language or dialect that my name is Amanda. My spirit name is Lynx um, from Unamagi territory in Wagner Cook First Nation. However, I live off territory and identify as urban indigenous, uh, currently residing in Guelph and was living in Toronto for about 20 years and was raised in Montreal and have extended family there. Um, I make all sorts of art, <laughs> I guess like everyone and this project has been quite an um, experiment in many different materials and mediums. Um, I'm gonna also, I don't have, I didn't bring notes so I might just be incredibly awkward and stuttery, <laughs> but my, my piece is called Skadega Mujawauti, which um, translates to Milky Way. And um, a Mi'kmaq linguist named Curtis Michael spoke about the epistemological significance of that word and how those words are derived from our cosmologies. So the, the suffix for the Illinoisi word for Milky Way is road, which is Auti, 
And the prefix translates to ghost or skedegamuj. And when I heard that, my body kind of experienced a sort of a chill to the bone um, as a reconnecting person to a culture that was kind of, you know, suffered the duress of intergenerational trauma. But there are ways that our worldview are embedded into language. And so um, by the time I was finished this work, I realized that it kind of encapsulated what I was trying to capture, which um, I wanted to talk about holding a ceremony with myself um, and the process of trying to connect to cultural practices and feeling a sense of longing and desire for community and feeling the constraints of social isolation through a pandemic, but also doubly so as someone who has been disconnected or has uh, estranged ties at looking for ways to find a map back to cultural identity. So in my work, there's a sense of like fragmentation or not really feeling entirely finished. Um, and it's just kind of like a, a stitching together of a few different things. So like myself wearing cultural regalia and then um, a mix of landscapes of when I moved to Guelph. So like some, a rip, like the river that's nearby and, um, and my experimentations with, uh, with animation, which has been very clumsy. So in it, you'll find like, I'll still have like mask paths and like different types of like, um, X, Y axes showing. And um, I think that kind of shows like where I'm at too spiritually. Um, in the end, I guess it's like kind of like a, a dreamy mishmash of things. Maybe it would be, maybe I can share a screen from here. Um, does it? having okay there's the share button <laughs> sorry to pause everyone like that I just got a new computer so I never like screen shared on it now it's telling me I need to open system preferences. <laughs> um, which is making this a little difficult in the moment. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right. Um, so thanks for bearing with me. I don't have a PowerPoint, but I just kind of like separated into different categories. This would be like a very process-based um, type of chat. So um, this will start with like the fact that throughout this process, um, it's it was like largely reliant on community care. So some of the my journey with connecting to regalia and powwow culture and um, sense of identity within that is by gifting and receiving gifts from others. So this was um, the bolo that I, I was wearing in in the video. It was um, gifted to me. Um, it's a really big bag of tobacco, which is one of our sacred medicines. And they were, it was given to um, participants of the organization that I'm working with, um, Canadian Roots Exchange. 
So in the process of learning how to sew and bead and um, I guess make moccasins and connect with cultural materials that um, I'm wearing in the piece, um, I'm mixing together these two ideas of like this material world and then like this, this digital, but um, with the org I work with, um, I launched a two-spirited uh, beginner regalia making program that uh, allowed youth across Turtle Island to connect and receive gender fluid teachings um, around powwow culture and ceremony, um, which for two reasons is really important. One is um, to combat the social isolation of uh, being in a pandemic and taking advantage the opportunity of virtual space um, to connect in such a way, which seems to be contrary to um, tradition and how things are often in person or with, on the land. Um, so there's that piece as well as feeling the ostracization or the exclusion um, from um, community members or elders or knowledge keepers who have colonized notions of how ceremony should be for different presenting genders. Um, so, um, so some people have sent me care packages um, and I also sent out care packages as well. So in the journey of teaching myself how to make certain, um, like in, in this picture, earrings, each of these have been gifted as I learn. Um, and part of the process of running this uh, workshop was that we were able to send supplies and tools to youth to participate and kind of like get over the barriers of what may keep them from making the things that they need to express themselves or to step into a spiritual identity. So we made these like lovely packages and um, mailed them. Um, some of it looks like with sending letters to kin or um, going to my painting practice and um, working on portraits of uh, either in or First Nations um, leaders that mean a lot to me. And just kind of showing the people that have taught me um, the things I know or that I've desperately wanted to connect to that I'm grateful and um, some of the people that I've mailed things to have imparted knowledge to me um, as well. So it's kind of giving back and it's also receiving that, that feedback from other true spirit um, change makers and artists and uh, personalities that seeing our identities reflected in community um, resounds and it travels further. So that's something that I was experimenting with in this piece um, is this idea of reciprocity and how this wasn't just something that was conceived of in a, in a manner for my own gain and uh, everything is kind of like interconnected. Um, in terms of challenging status quo, um, there were like some inspiration that I found from other makers that look at um, either ribbon attire that is queered in some way, which you'll see in this one, or challenging the notion that ribbon attire could only be shirts for men and skirts for women and, um, kind of looking at the ways that we adapt to our to our environments and what's around us. Um, 
So these are some makers who have challenged the conventions that I took with me. And I guess in some way I'm highlighting it back and um, show, sharing that. Um, in terms of environmental inspiration, um, I'm really drawn to nature overtaking <laughs> uh, urban spaces and or, I guess um, idea of becoming sovereign and understanding how to, you know, work the land for yourself. But um, when I moved to Guelph last year, um, this is down the street from me, there's a solar panel that um, relates back to the Mi'kma eight-pointed star. And it's not intentional by any means, but this is kind of, it goes back to petroglyphs and the ways that we spoke about our relationships. Um, there's a saying called like Nizit Melkama, which means all our relations. So the this star kind of shows um, the significance of how our past, presents, and futures are not linear. Um, they're existing in quantum time all the time. And in addition to that, we're thinking of generations forward and backward. So I, and this is just a cool pattern that some ducks made in the winter, but <laughs> I just thought it would be cool to add. But um, in the process of um, connecting back, we have different ways that we um, have used visual language to communicate things on our regalia. And these are called uh, double curves. In the piece, you'll find um, the double curve um, is moving through the animation. And it's kind of speaking to um, being ever present and also ebbing and flowing, but speaking to the connection to the spirit world coming back down to the earth world. Um, I spent, there's also like some really cheeky animation of fiddleheads. So um, these are just, <laughs> sketches that didn't come in order, but it shows kind of the process of what happened clumsily behind the scenes while I was trying to teach myself how to use 3D modeling software. I have a background mostly in painting and socially engaged art, a little bit of photo, and this is an entirely new terrain, literally. So my my use of modeling is very like, you know, very basic. Um, and they've been based on what I've been able to access while online and not with uh, or among people in person. Um, there are these animations in here. Um, and these are like astrological birth charts of my parents and they're, they're in motion and um, you can kind of see that's my own, but uh, just kind of taking textures and using them to storytell and embed these types of connections to personal relationship and remarking on the significance of um, taking all of those pieces and finding them valuable. Um, here's the source image of the fiddleheads. Um, I wanted to use this as kind of a, a sense of nature, but also um, one queer imagery and then also um, coming back to indigenous plant knowledges. So um, you may have eaten these, but um, 
what I learned about them is that they're a premature fern that has kind of like an asparagus taste, but they're only edible while they're in this like young state. And then eventually they turn into like a really like feathery looking fern. So it's kind of speaking to that transformation between um, being always in flux from one state to another. Um, and I guess in the animation, in the end, it kind of shows like this uh, very clumsy and humorous way that it just kind of like checks in and out of the frame. And so like, I kind of use this as a way to like speak to humility and speak to um, <laughs> the ways that we always remain fluid and our ideas of reality and spirituality are also fluid. Um, I'll go to the moccasin making process, which is also full of humility. Uh, I think um, all in all throughout this project, which had taken quite some time from start to finish, it had felt very stifled and like there were many moving parts that never wanted to actualize and visually just always felt in progress or even stuck, um, which was why I'd speak about community over and over again, because it, by my sharing of this story and sharing of my journey to understanding cultural knowledges or even just feeling like I'm not a failure at certain types of things. Um, other people, we all pal together and convene that information. And um, many people have like messaged to help me or give me some pointers. So making things wrong and starting over again um, <laughs> um, I ended up changing that design, um, getting comfortable working with animal materials that feel very, um, different than what I'm used to working with. Um, so this is what it looks like inside out. Um, getting help from my emotional support um at, at home um <laughs> also cutting yourself and taking things apart two to three times and starting over again and then just kind of coming back to um you know a state of completion finally but um, only with undoing and redoing over and over again um my sewing process. Okay, I can turn the volume down, <laughs> I think. There we go. Um, sewing was also not a forte of mine. So I had a friend who was also facilitating this group with me um, teach the youth how to sew using beginner basic stitches, um, show me as well. And in that way, we're all kind of showing each other what a two-spirit reality is and what, um, and what our knowledges present to us in terms of whether there's um, messages coming down uh, in terms of animal relations or um, the purpose of certain regalia pieces um, coming straight down to the imagery and use of materials. So um, connecting sky and land and the idea of um, those two places being um, where messages are sent back and forth and the the help of community, of course, again. <laughs> um, it's a picture of where I'm working, which is also right behind me. Um, 
And then in terms of cultural learning, um, being able to speak on behalf of um, an identity that has felt fragmented for a long time. So those are like animal cue cards and uh, this has looked like attending different language workshops. It's looked like um, being on Zoom with different teachers and facilitators and um, those constellations become connected with a story, a myth. And then they also become connected with what's going on in the landscape. But um, being blessed to participate in astronomy from an Ojibwe perspective or a Nakoda perspective and how we have had um, constellations of our own and how they tell our star stories. Um, so going back to um, this final way that it all kind of comes together with um, uh, glitches and mixing up like older mediums and finding how they can inform current practices and uh, it's kind of finding a way to storytell about feeling incomplete and then kind of coming down to um, a sense of everything settling in a place where things feel supported or aligned on an identity level, but also in a sense of um, a social responsibility or cultural responsibility. Um, I think within the within spirito mutuality, I also think about um, how it was inspired by the violences done to the lobster fisheries on the East Coast, where uh, I'm sort of from, but I'm, I'm a little bit more west of where that conflict um, is happening mostly and kind of sending prayer in that space by showing myself in a sense of vulnerability, showing myself as somebody that's visible at all and claiming that while also being tremendously afraid and vulnerable to do that. And kind of returning back to how um, social movements are relying upon the digital space to uh, create social change or to organize. And whether that's through an artistic medium or through um, fundraising efforts, um, there is something that happens via representation uh, and having other people that look like you or are on a similar journey to you, making themselves visible at all um, when they've historically been erased or have tried to be erased and kind of, um, kind of saying like, we're not, we're not gone, we're not extinct, we're, we're present we're resilient and we're finding ways to find one another kind of like a beacon or a homing device and how that could be an act of resistance to uh, land dispossession and just the idea of cultural erasure in itself. Um, I don't know how long I've spoken, but um, the one that I didn't share yet is emotional support. So kind of looking back at 
isolation and the sense of where you find the strength to create and who provides that to you. Um, so while I'm making, I'm being supported by <laughs> and interrupted by these helpful animals and my <laughs> cats. Are, they're also teaching me a lot of things. And I guess in terms of that spirit message coming, um, I awoke from the dream of uh, two bears um, being like, I was warning a child of these two bears in this suburban area by some townhouses and then a, a lynx showed up and it kind of felt like um, a very comforting presence and it was much larger than it should have been. It was like gigantic and it kind of felt like a teddy bear and it was guiding me along and then I woke up and then I saw the image of this, um, of this pouch that I, uh, is in this image and in many ways um, while I was creating this, my cats were present um, around me and I lost my senior cat in the making of it. Um, and I feel like a lot of the time when you receive messages to create um, or a vision, sometimes they can be protective. And in some ways, I think that seeing that um, vision of uh, making a regalia attire or this medicine pouch um, was a way for my cat to prepare me for him moving to the spirit world. So um, it kept me distracted, but, but they also kept me company the entire time. <laughs> so um, just incredibly grateful for, you know, the environment that's around us and the ways that maybe the mundane things or the relationships that are closest to us hold deep intrinsic value to our creative process and our, our spiritual well-being as well. That's that. <laughs> Anyways. Oh, thank you so much for sharing. This was really beautifully spoken and inviting us into your personal process. And it just is so meaningful, like to hear all about the exchanges and learning and collective engagement that becomes a part of your work. And I think all of our work really um, actually have so many things to say that the time has moved quickly. And I know Sabrina that you um, won't have as long, can't stay as long. So please take some time um, to talk about your work, Sabrina. Thank you, Miriam. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not gonna take long. Uh, I just really thank you everyone for sharing everything about your work and about your process. It's very really generous and very, uh interesting also uh so i guess i will go really quick as it's starting to rain <laughs> and i'm outside uh, so i guess i for this project i showed uh on dream which is a video that i've made in 2018 uh which i'm very fond of and i'm really happy that like there is an interest to show this piece yeah um so I guess before going into the piece itself, I can maybe just give a little quick background about um, my process and like uh, my practice. So, uh, so I, I guess I, now I'm in Montreal, but I live in, I've been living in Paris for five years. I'm going to Marseille in this year and probably will come back to Montreal because I miss Montreal a lot. Uh, but uh, so I've, I've studied a film production in at Concordia a while back, um, which was more concentrated on like 
the film as a medium and you know experimental film but then it took me a while to realize I was way more comfortable with video so I started to I guess dig in parallel to my studies uh you know, pioneers of video art and computer art, uh, artists such as Lillian Schwartz or, you know, the Vasulka were a huge influence on me. So I, st I really digged into, um, you know, video synthesizers and analog technologies and how, um, you know, video itself as a medium is, um, you know, what is intrinsic to this medium, how to work with this. And eventually through this process, I actually became more and more uh, aware of an interest I had for architecture, but mostly like the, you know, uh, virtual environment as well as physical environment that surround us and how these have impact on our psychology, on the way we live our daily life and even uh, the way we build our realities. So uh, I've included more and more like 3D animation into my process. And uh, eventually, I, I guess, you know, everything comes from video or the video signal. And then from there, I like started to explore like 3D printing, 3D scanning, uh, prints, um, installation work. Uh, so everything that comes from this signal and, and bring it into this material form and, uh, and, and bring it into uh, architect architecture as well. So uh, to go to Andre, maybe I can just show a, a quicker ex excerpt um, by sharing my screen really fast. Sh I share screen, okay, share. So th this is my email. <laughs> so this video was um, inspired by uh, um, Super Studio, who's um, Italian utopic, utopian kind of architectural group in the '60s. Who, um, who's I guess who's who's visuals, but also like I am. I, I, um, mentality had a, a huge influence on me so I, I it's really a video where I wanted to you know pay homage to to this to this architectural group that you know created this architecture that were never built but also to this era where um, I guess I'm kind of fascinated you know with um, you know the, the brutalist architecture but also all the utopian ideas behind all of these uh, ideas that through time and with, you know, uh, in, in contact with reality, we see today a lot of these ideas became dystopia in many ways. And um, so I think when you speak of architecture or even digital space, uh, you cannot avoid talking about at least like socio sociological events or um, even political events and social uh, realities. Uh, so I guess that's the, the angle I'm taking on all of these. It's like through those formal or technological aspect of our daily life, how these actually shape the way we evolve in um, these realities. Uh, so Andream is also an homage to early video art, but bringing in, you know, these 3D reality and uh, digital space and virtual reality and question and I guess uh, um, a very recurring th theme in my work is you know this questioning of like what is real how do we um, relate to reality and how do we construct that reality what are those social settings that inform this construction of reality and more and more, I think I'm digging into this more consciously and reading about, you know, more metaphysical questions. And uh, so I guess I'm really inspired by philosophical question and metaphysical question more and more. And I kind of own it more now. Um, but also this, you know, tension between the physical world and the digital world. So um, more recently, my work have been um concentrating more on uh you know scanning 3d objects so i was very interested uh in the anna Ayler and um i'm sorry i forgot the name of your 
um, collaborator who's gone. <laughs> so, um, I really enjoyed your presentation. It's really something that I'm uh, fascinated by how to, uh, you know, uh, scan real object and bring them into the digital world and have this, you know, different construction of reality through this material. So I guess that's like uh, where I'm heading at now. So like, for example, like a recent project I did was um, 3D scanning my own body, which is not like mostly my work is architecture and empty spaces without any humans. So this was like a big step for me to add human and on top of that uh, using my own body. It doesn't really show it that it's me. I guess I've reworked it a lot, but to me that was a really big step uh, into like bringing the body into my work and also reflecting on how we you know, want to, um, how the body does exist into that digital space and how it becomes kind of an architecture as well. Um, and most recently I've done this project uh, entitled Floralia, which is uh, 3D scans of flowers and trees that maybe I can show you a little excerpt. Uh, I guess this is like, um, as everyone else, I've been uh, reflecting a lot during the pandemic and uh, during uh, these times. And I was in the country and the night in the nature. So I read a lot of like Donna Haraway, but also Ursula Le Guin and uh, a lot of science fiction like Greg Egan. And I'm also very much inspired by science fiction. Um, so I guess this really inspired me to reflect on, you know, those, those that's, that mix between past, present and future that the Nahahawe, like she is so good at articulating uh, in a very uh, poetic and philosophical manner. And so this, this is like a, you know, a, an archive a, an, a, an archival room in the future of this nature that, you know, probably or might have disappeared and that we could only experience through, you know, virtual reality. And so this is the reflection of, lo like, of like these memories of these plants in, in that future where they will, be, <clears throat> they will have disappeared. Um, so I guess that's like the most, uh, I guess, uh, straightforward like piece that really like addresses questions like ecologies although my work is uh, more in a philosophical or contemplative kind of approach uh, I don't wish to um, provide a political message or any uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more looking for a different way of looking at things and um, that is maybe hopefully beyond world, words that we can experience that can bring a different sensibility to things. So that's kind of like how I work. And in that sense, maybe I'm also very close to paintings and formal, um, you know, looking for colors and compositions, uh, but also cinema has, this is my background. And so I'm thinking a lot about editing and um, the rhythm and sounds. So I collaborate a lot with musicians, in particular uh, Roger Thierry Craig, who's been I've been working with him for more than ten years, and I've been doing like live performances with him. So this is all part of my background. Like music is really important uh, in my work as well. And a VR version of this piece exists. And just as a con conclusion. Um, I'm going to just talk about a new piece that I'm going into really new territories. And um, I'm collaborating with Guillaume Arsenault, who's a wizard in technology. And we're going to do an um, installation. Um, um, I don't even, <laughs> I have it like a, 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 so it will be like an um, interactive installation where I will put all of my archives from like 2000 and, 10 until today uh, I've I've been digging in all these archives because I've been producing a lot of images that I've not been shown that I've you know I'm very like strict into what I I, I choose and crystallize in the work so I have like a few thousand of clips that will be shown 
uh, and they will be shown on different screens and be um, interacting with each other. It's a very different way for me to talk about uh, my work because I've never done any interactive installation before. So we'll show that at the end of um, next week, uh, no, on the 20th of August at, uh, as part of MUTEC at, uh, at LASAT. So the Montrealers between you guys can come maybe. Uh, and I'm here until the 25th as well. So that's where I'm at, I'm at now. And um, thank you very much for uh, this great conversation, Miriam, and thank you, everyone. And I guess I have to stop sharing. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sabrina. It's so exciting as well to see some of your new work, and I can't wait to see more about the installation at MUTEC. I actually, I really want to travel to Montreal and come to MUTEC. But... Please. <laughs> I know I'm thinking, oh, can I? But <laughs> thank you so much. And I think this, um, you know, when you speak about the confluence of realities and digital spaces and what we see and what we experience and what we create and then how we can come to like new ideas or a better understanding, um, I think that's also a really important part of your work and something that all of us share together this um, kind of grappling with you know what it is to create in digital forms and then how that does connect mm -hmm. with our like physical realities so yeah it's really mm -hmm. interesting thank you <laughs> <laughs> i have to leave guys thank you so much <laughs> bye bye and so diana green girl official would love to share more about your work Hi, um, thank you so much for having me in this show. And it's been so nice to hear about everybody's work. Um, I'm gonna go at extreme speed now because we're already 20 minutes over. Um, but just a little bit of uh, background, I guess, about me is that I am a multimedia artist. I kind of consider myself more to be like a collage based artist. Um, I studied painting, drawing, printmaking, moved into, in, moved into installation art. Um, and I guess in the past like five years or so have started to make some visual art that is more video based, um, starting with like animations uh, using After Effects and digital collages and keyframing, that, that type of thing. Um, and so the work that I'm doing now is kind of, I guess more, a bit more of an evolved version of that. Like I'm still using um, digital collages and uh, landscapes and textures and kind of documentation from uh, installations and paintings and stuff like that. But instead I'm um, painting landscapes with them within Unity Technologies, which um, is like a video game building program. So I use a combination of Blender to do 3D building and I get a lot of assistance because like many of you have found so many challenges with working with new technologies and um, have found ways to embrace, I guess, my failures in using these new technologies as well. Um, so let me try and share my screen. I have to say it's so like, so hard to wait until the very end after everybody's talking and then it's like ah, so much nervous energy so sorry if i'm not making like just the most sense but okay let's see if this works um so this is a bit of process can you see this wait where did you go Okay, everybody can see just this screen, right? Um, so yeah, this is uh, some documentation that I pulled from, uh, I guess, process work of world building within Unity. The landscapes are textured with different um, collages that I've made, or um, as I said, like documentation of installation art pieces. Um, and then I've pulled in these flowers and shapes and I, I kind of use a lot of the, oh. Hey, don't Sorry. Um, yeah, I use a lot of the default, like kind of particle settings, um, 
water settings, like animating kind of like suns and changing lighting to get different atmospheres. Um, but in building these landscapes, I always kind of like build a whole scene and then I don't know, I guess I was like rendering a video and wasn't feeling totally um, connected to it. So I've started to sort of capture many aspects of the journey within building and not just not just saying like, oh, I'm making like one finalized piece like built around a camera or built to be seen like in one particular way. Um, and I kind of liked how in Unity you could kind of zoom around and go under the landscape and see like the multiple layers of terrain. Um, so some of my videos uh, in our exhibition are showing that, like it's kind of a drone that goes under the landscape and around the landscape. I'll show you a little bit of that. I've always felt really connected to landscape. Um, I grew up in the countryside and have lived in Toronto for, um, I guess since like 2007. Um, I basically live in a concrete triangle. There's not really any landscape around me that is like supernatural. Um, and it's something that I've always really longed for, like seeing land, trees, water, flowers. Um, I feel like I kind of really explore that in my work by building out landscapes and atmospheres. Um, specifically, uh, the idea of like, you know, petals on a flower or insect wings, things that are like very psychedelic real moments in nature, things like the deep sea, outer space. Um, but then in my practice, kind of filling in that void, like filling in the void of real nature here in Toronto for me, like in where I'm living with um, kind of found objects, product packaging, lots of plastics and metallic foils and <clears throat> yeah, combining all of those ideas and creating these worlds that are kind of an exploded version of that, if that makes sense. So this is the work in our exhibition, I'll kind of zoom through, but it's basically an endless journey. Um, and then the second version of that, which I'm showing is an endless loop, which is inspired by kind of like the burning log idea um, or like, you know, river channel on YouTube, things that are supposed to be very meditative and soothing. Um, I don't know if anyone here uses those kinds of things to reach a state of peace and calm, but I, I found that I really uh, kind of sought that sort of visual, uh, especially in the few years after moving into the city. Um, yeah, so that's what these works are inspired by. And I think I'll show you one more. Um, sorry for my delay. Um, so this one was featured in the exhibition that I recently did with Sky Fine Foods. Um, it's called Liquid Mirror. And this one is sort of a very deconstructed version of the landscape. Like I build these uh, landscapes out and then do things like take away the terrain, um, animate the water, like the ocean plains, um, and kind of see what I can do just with my own limited means of animation through the program. So this is sort of my alternate reality ocean idea, I guess. And I've uh, made these to be experienced in AR, um, 
hopefully working towards more VR. Um, before the pandemic, I would install like a screen with kind of a lounge type area. Um, everything kind of goes back into each other. But yeah, I'm excited um, just to explore that a little bit more post pandemic. It's like gallery spaces opening again or event spaces. This is another version with the ocean plane, um, not animated. You can still see a bunch of the grasses and things like that, which were on the terrain above. And the sound is um, made through like sampling and kind of manipulating just through Ableton. Yeah. Um, so I'll stop my screen share. I feel like that was like the most awkward fast forwarded summary. Like I don't even know what I talked about at this point, um, but just trying to be respectful of time. So thanks for listening and it's been great to share with you. Thanks so much, Diana. Thanks everyone. And yeah, the time did go faster than anticipated. So we've been here for two hours. It's a pretty long time all together. Um, I would love if you want to come off mute and don't know if anyone has any sort of final questions or remarks just, at all. Sure. Um, just, we, we got to go real quick. I just want to thank everyone. It was really, really nice. Um, beautiful to see all these artists. <laughs> Yeah, really great to hear like behind the scenes process. I know that everyone has to go so we can just wrap it up and it's been a wonderful conversation. I think there's so much more to be continued. So we'll have to, you know, do it again. And thanks, Nicholas. Yeah, well, thanks, Anna. I, I just want to say thanks a lot to everyone, but also, yeah, Diana, thanks for speaking at the end. I just wrote it, but I know like it happens and it's um, the reality of it, but. I think it was enough for us to understand your practice and I'm sure, I mean, I'm curious to know more now. So maybe you know, you'll hear it from me, but uh, yeah, thanks Miriam for, for putting us all together. And I'm like, I'd love to you know, engage with you all at some point more, sorry, my fan is clicking. Uh, but yeah, thanks Amanda for sharing so much as well. That was really super inspiring and fair as well. Um, and Anna and Kala, I know you a little more, so uh, cool. Uh, see you soon in, in your life. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot. Great. Yeah, it is hard to go at the end. So thanks, Diana. And thanks for sharing. And I wish you all a lovely evening. And thanks to all those who were out there listening on YouTube and spending the evening with us. Thanks so much. And thanks for organizing, Miriam. Nice to meet everybody.